Hello, listeners. This is Kat, and welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This will be the last part to Someone to Protect Me. Nezu had dismissed Shotokun and Azuka-kun before lunch, having gotten all the information needed from Azuka-kun and wanting to give him a chance to relax and calm down again, while also putting together the final draft of the takedown plan for Altera Middle School. Just as Nezu picked up his phone to start dialing numbers to organize the takedown, he heard another phone ringing. He put down the receiver for the office phone and pulled out the cell phone that belonged to Izuku-kun. He had never given it back. He looked at the number and recognized it as belonging to Detective Sukauti Namasa of the Musutafu Police Department. Greetings, Detective. Am I a dog? A bear? A mouse? None of the above. I'm currently a teenage human. What can I do for you? What? Nezu? Is this Midoriya Izuku's phone? The detective asked. Yes, it is, he confirmed. There was an accident recently, and Izuku-kun and myself have swapped bodies. We don't know any other details yet, but I've uncovered some issues in Izuku-kun's life that I want to correct. If we have not returned to normal by the time I'm finished correcting these issues, I'll be reaching out to locate some assistance. I see, tsukauti san replied. Is it safe to assume you know where the boy is? Of course. He's been sticking close to Shotokun primarily, but can also be found with Hisashi-kun when Shotokun goes on patrol. May I ask what business you have with Izuku-kun? The detective sighed in defeat. A few days ago, I came across the body of a woman. It took us a few days to ID her, since she had likely had her purse stolen, but we finally figured out her identity this morning. Midoriya Inko. Nezu was quiet for a moment, before he muttered. At least that's a valid reason for not returning home. What was that? Detective Tsukauchi asked. I highly suggest informing Izuku-kun of this in person, Nezu said, ignoring the detective's question. If you want to come to UA, I can introduce you to him. How does 3 p.m. sound? One of the things Shota disliked most about the rat was his constant desire to throw off whatever plans Shota may have had. Today, for instance, he had planned to go grocery shopping with the kid, restock on his jelly pouches, and maybe get some snacks the kid might like for when he was back to normal. But instead, he's got to attend a meeting with someone. At least, he was told to bring Midoriya along with him, so he didn't have to leave the kid with Snipe or... Namuri. Don't get him wrong, Shoda loved her like a sister. And like any good sister, she made him want to shove her head first into the nearest wood chipper at least three times a day. He wouldn't trust her with a child if his life depended on it and he's got no clue how she managed to get a job as an actual teacher. As Shota opened the door to his sensei's office, he noticed that Namasa was there. His steps faltered for a half-step before he continued into the office. If Masa was there, and he was told to bring Midoriya, then this meeting was for him, not Shota. Going over all the details of his abuse at school with Nezu should have been enough. There's no reason Namasa would need to be involved, so this was another matter entirely. Did it have something to do with the boy's mother? Masa, good to see you, Shoda greeted. Shoda, I wish I was here under more cheerful circumstances. He stood up. May I assume you're Midoriya Izuku? He directed to the kid on Shoda's shoulder. Midoriya only nodded, so now Masa continued. My name is Detective Sukauti Namasa, and I work for the Musutafu Police Department. Nice to meet you. Midoriya said quietly. Come sit down, Nezu gestured to the couches, and Shota sat across from Naomasa and pulled the kid from his shoulder onto his lap. Midoriya started playing with Shota's fingers and hesitantly asked, Did something happen to my mum? Naomasa's eyes widened slightly, but he nodded in confirmation. Yes, I'm sorry to tell you this, Midoriya-kun, but we found your mother's body Wednesday evening. It took us a few days to ID her. He nodded sadly. She doesn't stay gone this long normally. She's always back in time to pay the rent. It was due on Friday, but she hasn't come back home yet. Every day that passed, I was more and more certain she either decided I wasn't worth the effort anymore, or that something happened. Oh, kid, Shota breathed and adjusted his hold on the boy to more of a hug. Midoriya raised his paws up to his face as if he was going to wipe away tears, but then stopped. Huh. I guess I can't cry, he whispered, voice cracking. Izuku-kun, Nezu quietly interjected. 
Whatever you need right now, we will assist you with. At least until we're back to normal, you can stay with Shodakun, and we'll figure out where to go afterwards. No. Shoda blinked, not expecting himself to say that, but continued anyways. No, I have a foster license, and so does Hizashi. We'll keep him. Even after you both return to normal, Midoriya can stay with us. The kid looked up at him, with a devastated look that had no place on Nezu's face. Are you sure? No one else has ever wanted me. Why do you? I just do, Shota replied honestly. All kids deserve a home, a family that cares about them, loves them, wants to protect them. And from the first time I saw you, curled into a ball clearly mid-panic attack, I've wanted to take care of you. So unless you decide you don't want to stay with me and Zashi, you're my kid now. Midoriya turned around and clung to Shota tightly. Shoda holding him just as tightly. The two of them sat there for a few moments, before Midoriya finally nodded. Okay, on one condition. Anything, kiddo. Call me Izuku. All right, Izuku. Shoda-kun, Hizashi-kun, and Izuku-kun had spent the rest of the day on Wednesday filling out paperwork to make Izuku-kun's fostering with Shoda-kun and Hizashi-kun final. And then Thursday at home, with Izuku-kun grieving over the loss of his mother. Nezu had spent that time sorting out the necessities and the non-essentials from Izuku-kun's apartment. The landlord had come by and informed him that he had until the end of the month to be out, so Nezu wasn't worried about not having to bring Izuku-kun back and determine what he wanted to keep. The last thing Nezu had to do was finalize the raid for Aldera Middle School. He had asked, and both Shodakun and Izuku-kun had agreed to go with him. So here they were, at nine in the morning on a Friday, with a few dozen officers and five heroes all taking their orders from Nezu, who was still in the body of Izuku-kun, while Izuku-kun was balanced on Nezu's shoulder. There was a commotion in front of the school, and Kotsky, just like everyone else, was curious about what was going on. He had seen who he thought was present Mike for a moment, his signature hairstyle towering above the officers as they started for the entrance of the school. Kotsky couldn't help but chuckle darkly at whoever fucked up enough to get a hero like present Mike to show up. He wondered which of the teachers it was and what they must have done. Maybe it was that freak in the science lab. Rumor had it he was cooking up some sort of drugs. Or maybe it was the history teacher. He had been really handsy with a few of the girls, and one of them left the school recently. Kotsky heard a rumor she was pregnant, but he hadn't believed it. Maybe it was true. The door to the classroom opened, and in walked present Mike, two officers, some homeless-looking bastard, and... Deku? The quirkless fuck was standing next to present Mike, all calm as can be, as if he hadn't bitten the absolute shit out of Kotsky's hand the other day. Deku pointed at Kotsky. Aside from the teacher, that boy there is to be collected. Sure thing, sensei. Present Mike nodded with a grin and approached Kotsky. Careful with him, the rat-looking creature on Deku's shoulder squeaked out. Kachan's quirk lets him make explosions from his hands. Who the fuck do you think you are to call me that? Kotsky demanded, stepping away from present Mike. Then why the fuck are you after me? The creature on Deku's shoulder lowered his head, almost sadly, but Deku calmly said, Izuku-kun has informed me of everything you've done to him over the years, and since I experienced your actions firsthand, I'm apt to believe him. Deku told you, wait, you aren't Deku. Who the fuck are you, then? I am Nezu, principal of UA, and you, Bakikokatsuki, will never be attending my school. Should you be released from jail before you graduate from high school, you'll have a black mark on your record that will prevent you from ever attending a hero school. You can't fucking do that to me! Kotsky screamed at the not Deku. Deku's just some quirkless fucking bastard. No one cares about him or about what happens to him. Present Mike had finally grabbed Kotsky by the arm and brought his hands behind his back. Kotsky tried to use his quirk, but nothing happened. What happened to his quirk? He looked around desperately, trying to find out what was going on, only to see the homeless extra glaring at him with glowing red eyes while his hair floated around him. The man's eyes and hair returned to normal as soon as Present Mike put handcuffs on him. You're wrong, President Mike said. About all of it, but mainly that no one would care. I care. He pointed to the homeless guy. He cares. He pointed to Deku. He also cares. 
Midoriya Izuku has people who care about him, people who want to see him happy and healthy. As President Mike escorted Kotsky out of the classroom, the homeless extra added, Oh, he's also not quirkless, and never has been. Kotsky's rage-filled screams echoed throughout the school as he, a few other students, most of the teachers, and even the principal, were loaded up into squad cars. Izuku was sitting on the arm of the couch next to Izashi, playing with his blonde hair absently as he processed the events of the day. Kachan had been arrested. His homeroom teacher had been arrested. The science teacher, history teacher, math teacher, and half a dozen other teachers had all been arrested. Everyone who had ever treated him like he was subhuman was now in jail. He didn't know how to feel about that, honestly. He knew that he should feel relieved that he was safe, happy that he was getting justice, maybe a little sad that his best friend, no, both Nezu and Shota said that Kachan wasn't his friend, that his former friend was never going to be able to achieve his dream. But honestly, all Izuku felt was numb. Don't get him wrong, he was happy that he was going to be safe, getting justice, all that other stuff, but it was also tempered by the fact that he had just lost his mother. She might not have been the best mother, but she was still his. He was going to be getting a new family, in Shota and Hizashi, and he was happy about that, happy that they wanted to keep him, but he didn't think they'd ever be able to replace her. Did he want them to replace her? He knew they were going to be better than she was. They had already proven that. They had brought out a laptop and ordered new things for his bedroom. A new bed set, shelves, dresser, desk, chair. Hizashi even tried to get him to pick out decorations, only backing down when he was reminded that Izuku had a lot of hand-drawn posters already. His mom had never done things like that. Everything he had, she had gotten from a thrift store, whether it was bedding, clothes, or furniture. Aside from school uniforms and school supplies, Izuku had never had anything new. His mother had rarely spent time with him, not since he turned nine and had proven he could cook for himself. She went out every week, for days at a time, and would usually come home smelling like alcohol, ignoring his very existence just to pass out in her room. Most recently, when she came home, it was while he was sleeping, and she'd stay just long enough to get groceries, leave a little bit of money on the table for him to buy whatever he might need, and be gone again by the time he came home from school. In comparison, he's barely been able to go an hour without either Shota or Hizashi acknowledging him. With little scratches behind the ear, head pats, a quick grin, constant hugs, or even, Hey kiddo, you doing okay? You're really quiet and seem lost in thought. Anything you want to share? Hizashi interrupted his thoughts, just proving Izuku's point. They are aware of him, of his moods, and they care. Izuku let himself fall forward and hug Hizashi. I'm okay, he said with a nod. Just trying to process the day. Hizashi hummed as he hugged Izuku and started rubbing his back. Yeah, today must have been hard. If you want to talk about it, you know I'm here and so is Shota. Or if you don't want to talk about it with us, we can set up sessions with Rio, sorry, Hound Dog, and he can help you sort out your feelings. Izuku nodded. He could definitely get used to this whole being cared about thing. Nezu blinked open his eyes and twitched his ears. Oh dear, this is not where I fell asleep, he muttered and sat up. He glanced down at himself, pleased to see he was back in his own body, and grinned. Hopping out of the bed he was in, he quickly got dressed in the clothes that Izuku-kun had graciously laid out the night before. Once he was dressed, he opened the door to the room he was in and walked down the hallway to Shota-kun and Izashi-kun's bedroom. Wake up, Shota-kun! I need you to go collect Izuku-kun! Nezu called out cheerily. Nezu had to quickly dodge a throne pillow as Shota-kun sat up. It is five in the fucking morning, you rat bastard. I just fell asleep, Shota-kun snarled at him. Yes, yes, very sad. You have five minutes to get ready before I hotwire your car and drive myself to collect my newest student. Izuku yawned and rolled over in bed, blinking slowly. This was not the room he was expecting to wake up in. He sat up, noticing he had fingers again. At least this time I know what to expect, he mumbled. Izuku recognized he was in Nezu's home once again, so he wasn't going to panic. He looked to see what time it was and, seeing it was just past 5 a.m., winced. 
Shota wouldn't be too happy if he called him right now. He'll wait a few hours and then call Hizashi. With that plan in mind, Izuku went to the kitchen to get himself a glass of water and see if there was any food that wasn't raw meat he could make for breakfast. There wasn't anything in the refrigerator he'd be willing to eat, but on the countertop, there was a box of granola bars. With a shrug, and knowing that Nezu wouldn't be able to eat them anyways, he opened one and took it and a glass of water to the counter. He had just taken the first bite of his granola bar when he heard Shota's irritable grumbles on the other side of the front door. Why the fuck couldn't you have dragged Hizashi out here at ass o'clock in the morning? Why did it have to be me? Izuku glanced at the time again, noting that it was only 5.15. He winced at that, knowing that when Shota patrolled on Friday nights, he didn't get home until about 3.30. Mix in his insomnia, and he probably hasn't slept yet. The door opened, and Nezu walked in, grinning brightly at Izuku. Ah, Izuku-kun, good morning. I had hoped you'd be awake. Izuku nodded. Yeah, good morning. He looked at Shota, who was still glaring at Nezu, attempting to eviscerate him with his glare alone. With a small smile, Izuku walked up to him and hugged him. I'd say good morning, but I don't think you see much good in mornings. Shota sighed out in defeat and wrapped his arms around Izuku. It'll be a good morning when I manage to finally get to sleep, he grumped. Speaking of, you ready to go home, kid? Izuku nodded and looked up at Shota with a grin. Yeah, let's go home. Name, Otori Arisa. Age, 47. Quirk, bring me justice. Quirk details. When two people who meet the requirements are touched at the same time, user is able to connect the two people in some way. Current known methods, telepathic communication, proximity limitation, body swapping. Requirements for activation. One person is experiencing a grave injustice, and the other is able to help. Effects last until the injustice the first is experiencing has been resolved. Nezu read the file, remembering that day five years ago when he had gone shopping with his Ajikun for a birthday present for Shotokun. He did remember that a woman had tripped and fallen on him, as he was trying to listen in to Izuku's analysis of the fight. He should send her a thank you card. He likely never would have met the boy if it hadn't been for her. Izuku-kun's mind was a wonderful thing, and after studying with Nezu for five years, the boy he had come to think of as his grandpa had graduated top of his class from the support course and already had seven different offers from various support companies as a quirk analyst. The door to Nezu's office opened, and Izuku-kun's head popped in. Hey, Ji-chan, Papa wants to know if you're coming to dinner tonight. Dad's hoping you say no, Toshi's hoping you say yes. He loves watching Dad's reactions to your daily dose of chaos. Nezu cackled. Of course, I'm coming to dinner. He really had to, after all. He was 97.4% certain that Izuku-kun's boyfriend, Shinso Itoshi, was going to be asking his grandpop to marry him tonight. And Nezu had a lovely shovel talk prepared for just such an occasion. All right, listeners, this concludes the fic entitled Someone to Protect Me. I hope you all enjoyed this one. I really like it a lot. I think just from a podfic standpoint, it was a really cool challenge to have to flip the personalities with the voices. Let me know, though, what you all thought. And if you have an opportunity, if you like the fic, to slide over to AO3, leave those comments and kudos to the original author because they did an amazing job with this fic. Ultimately, this was a one-shot I really liked, and I've never before come across a one-shot or at least a body swap fic at all where Izuku and Nezu actually flip. I just thought it was a really cool concept, and I enjoyed the fact that we got to see the actual quirk they were hit with towards the beginning at the end of the fic, too. Not to mention that little snippet of Shindeku we got at the end as well. So be sure to drop those comments below, and as always, thank you all so much for listening.